Okay, I think I am going to try and keep an eye on people coming in, but I think, um, yeah, I think we'll make a start. So, hi, it's great to have you here today. My name is Pippa. I am a York-based writer, blogger and speaker. It's wonderful to be part of York Disability Week this week, and they've got some great events happening throughout the rest of the week as well. Some of them are in person if you happen to be in the area, others are online like this one. So, it's worth having a look on your Disability Week's website because there's a really great program of stuff happening this year. I should say as well, actually, this session is about fatigue. I live with a chronic illness myself. And just to be fully transparent, I am having a weird symptom day today. So my fatigue isn't too bad today, but I keep having little dizzy spells. I get brain foggy. So if you see me occasionally glancing to the side here, it's because I've got my notes on screen here. And I hope you'll forgive any little um, flops in concentration. I'm sure we all know what that's like. Um, and as I said, yes, feel free to leave any questions in the chat box. We will come to them at the end. I will say this session is being recorded and I'm going to share it on YouTube afterwards. So if you do need to duck out at any point, if you need to stop, take rest breaks, there will be stuff to refer back to. I'm going to let in a few more people. Um, fabulous. And yes, so please bear in mind that the session is being recorded um, with what you share. I will keep any um, chat box suggestions anonymous, um, but just so you're fully aware of that as well. Um, as I said, we have Jenny doing the BSL today, which is brilliant. We also have live captions that you can enable if you require them. Um, oh, wow, we've got a lovely number of people here. That's fabulous. Okay. So we're talking about fatigue today and with any discussions about fatigue, there does have to be a really important caveat at the start. And as we all know, fatigue varies so much in severity. It is such an individual thing. And I would put money on the fact that even within this group of us here today, there will be wildly different experiences of fatigue. And as for me myself, I do only represent a subsection of the chronic illness community. I am very fortunate to have experienced an improvement in my symptoms over the years. And it may be that not everything I share here today is going to resonate with you personally, but I'm really going to try and do this as mindfully as possible in the hope that you can take away the things that I'm sharing and consider how they might work within the context of your own situation. So as I said, I have experienced chronic illness improvement. It's also really important to acknowledge that I am white, I am cisgender, and that automatically means that I, I don't have to face some of the barriers that other people with chronic illnesses have to contend with. I don't have any real caring responsibilities right now, but I have experienced caring responsibilities this year. And if you have any kind of responsibilities like those and you're managing that alongside chronic illness and fatigue, I honestly take my hat off to you. That is incredibly challenging and you are just incredible. I hope you know that right off the bat. Um, so these things and this privilege that I have in some respects does mean that some of the adaptations that I'm going to share today might be more achievable for me and people like me than those in other situations. But despite all of that, I do really strongly feel that there is always fulfillment and joy to be found in the everyday, regardless of what the everyday looks like for you. So first of all, I wanna talk a bit about fatigue generally, and then I'm gonna share five of the ways that I've managed to find fulfillment alongside living with fatigue, and then hopefully leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So fatigue, all of us know too well, fatigue isn't just a case of being really, really tired. I think often it can be really difficult for non-disabled people to wrap their heads around what fatigue really is, because often they're inclined to compare it with their own experiences of fatigue, which generally looks just like being really, really tired. And that is, of course, cate categorically not true when you're living with any kind of long term illness. And when people do compare it in that way, I know that feeling can be incredibly invalidating. However, Thanks to social groups and organizations who've been doing really important work over the last few years, we are beginning to see much more specific language and terminology that can help to better capture our experiences of fatigue as we know them. So in recent years, an organization called Chronic Illness Inclusion have carried out some really great extensive research in this area. And some of their findings have been really, really striking. And I'm gonna leave a link to them later because it is such an interesting read. But the one I want to share to start off with is something that has stayed with me ever since I read it. 
and they found that although many participants in their research study described fatigue as being their most debilitating symptom, they simultaneously felt that fatigue was the symptom that least qualified them to identify as disabled. And that for me was really, really telling. Now, I generally use phrases like chronic illness and disability, and sometimes I do use them interchangeably, but there are definitely important differences between chronic illness and disability. And as much as I think we would all agree, we would really love treatment or a cure for the fatigue that comes with chronic illness. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? I think the most we can do as individuals at this moment in time is look at how we can better adapt our lives to better accommodate the fatigue we live with. And something that my experience has shown me over the last few years, that if you want to access a, a, appropriate support and adjustments in your everyday life, you do need to find ways of identifying as disabled, because whether or rightly or wrongly, that seems to be easier for non-disabled people to understand. And that's why chronic illness inclusion have introduced some new terms that are hopefully going to better reflect the very unique challenges that come with chronic illness within the wider context of disability. So one of the things they propose is that sometimes instead of using the word fatigue, it might be helpful to use the term energy impairment. And the reason they say that is that that could help to better distinguish between the everyday tiredness that non-disabled people experience and the objective loss of function that comes with chronic illness. Now, they also group together conditions where this kind of energy impairment is a key symptom, and they use an umbrella term called energy limiting conditions. So if you use me here, if you hear me using terms like energy impairment and energy limiting conditions going forward, that's where they come from. And like I said, it's really worth having a look at that research. So in a nutshell, energy limiting conditions include things like ME, fibromyalgia, cancer, long COVID, inflammatory bowel diseases, and so many more as well. So first of all, please feel warmly welcome to use these terms to help communicate your lived experiences going forward. I have, pers I can only speak from personal experience, but I have found they've made a real difference in how I kind of explain my lived experience to people who don't necessarily have that shared experience they can draw upon to help them understand it. So, of course, we do need societal change and we need increased awareness if we really want to change the lives of people with fatigue and energy limiting conditions. But while that is hopefully taking place today, I want to share five things that might help you on a personal level. So I want this to be a mix of practical tips, advice and a few reflections on what I've learned over the last decade as well. As you probably say, actually, in case this is the first time we've met, I've lived with chronic illness since I was a teenager. My own diagnosis is ME. Um, it took four years to find the right diagnosis. Again, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Um, and yes, I am very fortunate to live independently as a young adult, but it's definitely not without its challenges. Now, the first thing I want to share refers to pacing. And Anytime I hear the word pacing as somebody else, you do automatically do a little internal eye roll sometimes, don't you? Because pacing is one of those buzzwords in the chronic illness community that everybody knows. And yet it's categorically one of the most difficult things to achieve alongside the thriving, busy modern life. And back in the day, I used to think that it was the act of pacing that was making me unhappy because back when I was at my worst, I had to miss out on so many of the things that used to bring me joy because I had to make sure that my symptoms weren't going to be unbearable the next day. So a lot of the time I really resented pacing because although I knew it was something that was going to help me on a physical level, it often meant that I had to make compromises in terms of my own happiness and fulfillment. I'm just going to let a couple of more people in. Fabulous. Now, I also had a very flawed understanding of what pacing actually was. So in my head, I equated pacing just in terms of time laid down horizontally in a dark, quiet room. And I thought that the more of this time that I could cram into my day in any shape or form, the better I was doing. I wanted to nail pacing, which is a really problematic way to approach it, because that's just not going to serve anybody. But here's where I was going badly, badly wrong. Back in my early days of chronic illness, I'd try and bulldoze all through all of the tasks I needed to get done on any given day. I'd try to do them as quickly and efficiently as possible because in my head, I thought that by doing that, I was giving my myself more time to rest. And let me tell you right now, that is so flipping silly. So I might've been trying to prioritize rest time and my intentions were good, 
But by speeding through the tasks and more often than not overexerting myself in that moment and not considering the tasks themselves, I was really just undoing any of the good that the extra rest time might have brought me. So it's, hang on, I'm just gonna let a few more people in. <laughs> Hi everyone. If you've just joined, it would be great if you could meet yourself. Um, this session is recorded, we've made a start already, but you will be able to catch up on this later. So just to confirm, it would be fabulous if you could mute yourselves. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I was overexerting myself. And by doing that, I was just really taking away any of the good that pacing would have done me in the first place. And I found that by doing that, often my nervous system was in such a state of overwhelm that the, ring time, the rest time I'd ring fenced in that way would have been more about damage control than actually bringing anything positive to my life. Um, sorry, I'm just going to triple check that everyone's on mute just because I want this to be accessible for everybody. And I know that background noise can sometimes be a little bit painful. Now, I'm not going to claim to be any kind of expert on the art of pacing because goodness knows, even now, we're 12 years in, there are still so many times where I managed to get it wrong. But there are a few good resources I've found over the years, and I will share some helpful links at the end. But for me, the main thing I've learned about pacing day to day in this fast paced life we live in is that by doing your necessary tasks a little bit more slowly and mindfully, it isn't just a positive in terms of your condition management, although that's really, really important. It often means that those tasks you're doing are a bit more enjoyable in the moment too. Now, I did find it really hard to think of a relevant example to try and explain what I mean here. And this one I know won't be relatable to everybody here because like we said at the beginning, fatigue is so subjective. But I am able to cook for myself these days more often than not, which has been such a massive improvement and something I'm massively grateful for. Now, in the past, I would try and have a million different things going at once when I was cooking because I'd be multitasking, I'd be trying to take extra steps. And in my head, I thought that by getting everything done and tidied up as quickly as possible and by spending as little time on my feet as possible, I was pacing. But by the time I sat down with my meal, I'd often feel so mentally and physically frazzled that I never really enjoyed the food anyway. Um, so now what I do these days is I think about how I can break each component step down into smaller parts and sometimes where I can I spread them out over the day instead. So I've learned to let go of the fear that my kitchen isn't always going to be clean and tidy, it's not going to be all taken care of before I sit down and savour my food, because I know now that I will be much better off in the long run if I have some rest time first. And maybe I'm overthinking this a little bit, but ever since I've become more mindful about doing everyday tasks like this, I actually think the food tastes better too. And I'm not just saying that because one time when I was doing it the old, old way, I was so busy thinking about something else that I should be doing that I accidentally unloaded about three quarters of a pepper shaker onto a handful of new potatoes. And they were the last ones in the pack, didn't have anything else in the fridge and hadn't done a food shop. So I ended up just having to have a very pungent meal that day. But that's just one example. I, I do think that there is value in doing that in the long term as well. So I think the point I want to make about pacing generally is that it doesn't always have to be this very strictly regimented approach that it's often conveyed as online and by healthcare professionals. So you don't have to live that very aspirational, slow living life that's become so glorified on social media. It's not always a case of like getting up slowly and wandering outside in a beautiful garden for fresh air, perhaps doing some meditation or chanting. If you've been watching I'm a Celebrity recently, you don't have to do a Boy George. That's not what this is about. Because pacing will look different for every single person. And it's important to consider that within the context of our individual lives and our individual access needs. So when it comes to pacing, I think it's valuable to look inwardly and consider how you can make it work for you rather than comparing yourself with others, even those with the same chronic illness. So kind of related to pacing is the next point I want to share. And it's something really important to me. And that point is compassionate goal setting. And again, we're not going to fall into the trap of thinking that productivity is the be all and end all of everything in life. But in my personal experience, I do find that one of the best ways I can find a sense of accomplishment, even within the challenging circumstances of chronic illness, is to try and set incremental goals for myself. So we could talk about this for a long time, but we do live in a world that glorifies success and accomplishments, arguably more than it should do. And it's really important to recognize that every single person has different priorities and aspirations in life. 
So I am possibly going to be a little bit of a hypocrite with this one, because for me, a lot of my goals do revolve around my work in my career, because I'm very lucky to be in a line of work that really brings me a lot of fulfillment and that I really love. And most of my goals happen to be writing based, because as well as being my job, that's my hobby. Again, all kinds of stuff we could talk about with that one, but not today. But the important thing I want to emphasize here is that goal setting within the context of chronic illness isn't just about tangible physical accomplishments. What it boils down to is it's about identifying what matters most to you as an individual and finding the enjoyment in the process of reaching those goals and not just in the end result. So we're not talking about physical things, you know, all the silly things about like increasing your walking distance, increasing your sitting up, doesn't have to be anything like that. So, oh yeah, I've jumped the gun a bit there because I wanted to say that a lot of non-disabled people might assume that a chronically ill person's goal might be to walk a little bit further, to sit up in bed a little bit longer. But the kind of goal setting I'm talking about here relates much more to your personal interests and the things that you feel are going to bring value to your life. So if you're a book reader, it might be that you want to read a certain number of books that are outside your comfort zone. So the actual number of books that you challenge yourself with and the time period you choose to do that with are totally your call because you know better than anybody what's going to be comfortable and realistic for you. And that's what I really mean by compassionate goal setting. It's about having something to work towards that you will find a sense of pride in, but also knowing that the process of getting to that goal is going to be accessible and comfortable and more importantly than anything, enjoyable for you. Again, I have fallen short here in the past, so I also happen to love reading. I don't know if you can tell. Um, and I used to get quite wild with my book challenges. I really wanted to read a really ambitious amount of books in a really short space of time. But I found that the problem with doing that is that I'd often be so worried about meeting the goal that I've set for myself. I'd be so preoccupied with that in my mind that I wasn't even enjoying the books that I was reading. So really, what was the point in that? So yeah I just didn't immerse myself and like that wasn't a compassionate goal I set for myself because it took away the enjoyment in the process so I think the thing I want to convey here is to think about the things that you as an individual really enjoy and you feel bring value to your life and yes don't be afraid to challenge yourself a little bit but really consider how you can do that in a way that shows compassion to yourself and the challenges that you live with now, the next thing I want to talk about is something very close to my heart, and that is mobility aids. And if we're connected online, you might see that I talk about mobility aids quite a lot. So by mobility aids, I'm not necessarily just talking about walking aids. So things like wheelchairs and power chairs and sticks, but there are also many other types of equipment that can make day to day tasks easier when you have an energy impairment. So things like shower seats, adaptive kitchen aids, communication tools. I've got a really massive list and I do actually have a list that physically exists somewhere. So I'm going to share a link to that later on. It's basically aids and equipment that can help you manage fatigue. So I hope that's helpful. I will share a link. Now, something I've noticed a lot during my time online is that people with less visible symptoms and less visible disabilities are often more hesitant about using mobility aids. And the reason for that seems to be that they don't know if they're quote unquote allowed to use them. So many people with these conditions feel as though they need to seek external position, uh, permission, not position, external permission before utilizing aids and equipment. And personally, I think the reason for that is that so many of us have experienced stigma and gaslighting from medical professionals that we end up questioning ourselves whether we're even as ill as we think we are. And again, that's a whole other topic and something that profoundly affects the majority of people with fatigue and less visible disabilities. But it is something I still contend with this, uh, to this day, and that's despite knowing that I live with a life-altering condition. But if you do feel like you need external permission if you want to utilize mobility aids, then this is it right here. So if using mobility aids inside or outside the house is gonna make day-to-day -day life easier or more comfortable for you, or maybe even enable you to do more, then mobility aids are for you too, and you have full permission to use them. So looking back now, I find it very telling that I went for so long without starting to use a wheelchair. So even though I could barely leave the house and walk for more than a few meters at a time, the idea of using a wheelchair never even crossed my mind until I saw other young people with the same condition and realized how much using a wheelchair improved their quality of life. 
So back when I was more unwell, I used a transit wheelchair that would be pushed by somebody else. I call that wheelchair George. He is still with me to this day, although he is not thriving. And these, yeah, these days I use an electric wheelchair who I call Janice. Now, she's a bit temperamental as Janice. I'm not even going to lie about it because I did have to fund her myself and she was one of the more affordable models. I might as well be transparent about it. But because of my power chair, I can leave the house and do so many more fun things than I ever could have imagined would have been possible alongside living with my energy limiting condition. It has truly changed my life. And I wish more than anything I had had that realization sooner. Like wheelchairs aren't for everybody, but for so many people, they can be the key that unlocks all kinds of things that for so long haven't been possible. And I do have a video online actually about user mobility aids with ME and that video delves a bit deeper into some of the challenges of user mobility aids with a chronic illness, but ultimately for me the pros far outweigh the cons. And that's the thing really, your justification for user mobility aids like this doesn't just have to be the medical side of it. If it helps you to manage your symptoms or improve the pain and fatigue levels, then absolutely that's a great reason for using them. But it doesn't have to be just medical. If mobility aids are going to improve the social side of your life or the personal happiness that you experience, then that is just a valid reason for using them, in my opinion, as anything on the more medical side. So I really do recommend having a look at the different kinds of mobility aids that are out there. Like I mentioned before, there are all kinds of funky ones now. And they may even be the key not only to managing your limited energy and the energy envelope you have on any given day, but they might also help you to make your hobbies and interests more accessible and in turn bring more joy into your life as well. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is something that's a big part of all of our lives, but it's arguably the most difficult thing when you add chronic illness into the question, and that thing is socialising. So it's a bit of a double whammy with socialising when you have things like fatigue, because on the one hand, it might be that you struggle to leave the house as much as you would like to. You can't meet or meet up with people as often you would like to. And on the other hand, fatigue can also put a lot of strain on existing relationships as well. So I spent many of my early years with chronic illness grappling with how exactly to explain what I was going to with my friends and family. And I just wanted more than anything to try and make them understand what I was experiencing. I wanted them to see that I was living with this really life altering thing. But at the same time, I wanted them to realize that underneath it all, I was still me, the same me that I had always been. And I had an identity that was still for the most part separate from my condition. But I imagine that if any of you here have tried to have that same conversation, you'll know that communicating that in an effective way is really blooming difficult. It is so incredibly challenging. Just going to let a few more people in. Hi, everyone, if you've just joined. Um, we've been going for a little while, but this session is being recorded, so you will be able to catch up. So we're on socialising at the minute, and I am working on something separate to this, which focuses on chronic illness and friendships more broadly. And there are now some good resources online if you're looking for ways to talk to others about your disability. But I decided I want to be brutally honest here in what I share, because there is one thing that's relieved pressure on my social life more than anything else, even if you might not expect it to. And that was simply having the realisation that no matter how much I try to explain what I'm going through, the majority of non-disabled people in my life will never truly understand my lived experiences or what this is like. As much as I wish that was, wasn't true, it's just something that I've had to acknowledge. And on the surface, you might assume that that was quite an isolating realisation to have. And like I said, I really wish that wasn't the case. But coming to terms with that fact that not everybody is going to understand, that's one of the things that has really helped me to move forward in my relationships with others. So it's, of course, still really important that other people do have knowledge of your condition and that they know how to support you. And I think it's really valuable when people want to learn more. And it definitely can be really powerful to have those conversations. But I think that simply managing my expectations when it comes to others has kind of allowed me to take all of that energy that I was plowing into trying to get other people to understand and funnel it into those actual friendships instead. So again, on the surface, it might seem like I'm admitting defeat there, but for me personally, that has brought a lot of value to my life and re it's really shown me that I can't. Well, that's the thing, you can't control other people's reactions. All you can do is try and make the best of what you have and consider how you can move forward. 
And yeah, people do have mixed experiences on this. But personally, I think there is some sort of balance to be achieved here. So I do think it's really important to try and educate people where you can. And sometimes sharing your reality can be an incredible bonding experience because by being vulnerable in that way, your friends might feel more comfortable to be vulnerable about any challenges they're facing too. But in the same breath, please don't feel like it's entirely on you to try and change the world or that you maybe have to terminate friendships with people if they can't seem to grasp your reality, because it doesn't have to be that black and white. It definitely doesn't have to be that binary. So if the pros of one particular friendship outweigh the cons, then I do still think it's really valuable to have those people in your life and cut them off. Because believe me, I've tried that too, and it's not always the solution you think it's going to be. I know that sometimes it can be really easy to think that isolating yourself is going to be less painful than feeling as though you're cast out. But if you have friends and they're still bringing joy and fulfillment into your life, then I would definitely think twice about casting them away. Just think about how you can consider what's going to work for you in the friendship going forward and what's going to be worth your energy expenditure. All of that said, if you are feeling lonely in your existing friendships at the minute, or perhaps you're surrounded by non-disabled people, which was the case for me, I felt that what I was experiencing was really abnormal because I didn't have anybody else I could relate to. I'd really recommend leaning into social media and the online chronic illness community. And I imagine most people here today are part of that community in some shape or form. But if you're not, I would just really lovely, love you to know that there are so many incredible people living with similar conditions who are out there in the world and they are just, they can be a life raft. I truly would have been lost without the chronic illness community. And I do think one of the reasons where I've been able to get to the place where I am now, where I'm quite happy and I'm very comfortable in my chronic illness identity is because I've been able to connect with and learn from others who've helped to normalize this experience for me. So something really weird, a really weird shift that's happened in the last few years is that I've gone from thinking that I'm the abnormal one for living with chronic illness to seeing people who don't have any long-term illness as the abnormal ones, like in my head, they're the muggles like that it's just completely different and if the idea of wading into the online world scares you a bit that's totally okay it can be helpful to remember that you don't necessarily have to share your own story or lean into the content creator side of it if you don't want to because sometimes even just following other people who make you smile or who you can relate to or you feel like you gain something from that can be such a validating thing. And like I said, that has done wonders for me. And I don't know, maybe, I hope I can maybe be that person for somebody else as well. And the final thing I want to mention here before we move on to questions and have a chat is simply self-acceptance. And this one is a real biggie because whether we realize it or not, many of us, I think, still carry, carry a level of shame about our chronic illnesses. And often that's, of course, a byproduct of this really inaccessible world we live in. We live in a world that simply wasn't designed for people with the limited energy envelope or have mobility challenges. And often it's the case that if we don't fit into the stereotypical idea of what society sees as a successful person, or perhaps we go about our lives in a slightly different way to everybody else, we think that we're somehow failing or falling short because our lives don't look the same as other people, the people who we've been taught are the successful people. And if I'm being really honest, I do still have a lot of internalized ableism in the back of my mind. And to this day, I'm still trying to unpack it all. And that can be really difficult and really exhausting. And in my case, as you might have picked up on, I do really value my work and my career, not just because of the sense of accomplishment it brings me, but because I genuinely enjoy it and I get a lot out of it. And even though I've built my career around my chronic illness and I've figured out a few ways to make the physical side of working more accessible, there's still a part of me that usually feels like I'm falling short because I'm not doing a nine till five day like everybody else, or I'm not commuting to an office, or I'm not doing any of these other things that we've been conditioned to see as the norm. And even if you're not working yourself or you have different values and different priorities, I think I'd put money on the fact that there's probably going to have been times where you've compared yourself with others who don't have the same condition that you do and feel as though you're not quite hitting the mark either. And I really, really wish that wasn't true because I think you are probably doing a lot, lot better than you think you are. 
So self-acceptance is still something I'm very much working on and there's no easy fix for the internal challenges you're facing as much as I wish there was. But one thing I've come to realize with absolute certainty is that in this sense, the very best way to find fulfillment and live in a meaningful way for you is to redefine what success and happiness actually looks like to you, what they truly mean to you rather than what you think the world wants to see from you. And I think sometimes you do have to sit with that question for a little while to really find what your gut is telling you. And sometimes you'll find that the things you truly want might be things that surprise you. And again, that's often a byproduct of having things channeled into your head from the world around you and society and the media. And sometimes it can be really difficult to just sit and think to yourself, what are the things that truly matter to me? What are the things that bring me happy? And what are the steps I can take in order to get to those things? And like I said, it's definitely not going to look the same for everybody because we're all unique individuals. We're all dealing with different challenges, especially within the context of long term illness. So I suppose what I really want is just to urge you to tune into that and to have that conversation for yourself, because once you have an idea of what that real joy and purpose looks like for you, it starts to matter much less what other people are thinking or doing. And I kind of hate myself for saying this because it's so cheesy, but you really do start to become the main character in your own story. You start to become the protagonist. And that, for me, has been such a powerful thing. Sometimes it's figuring out what actually matters to you that can be the really tricky part. But once you have that in your mind somewhere, you can start looking at how to make these things more accessible and more achievable for you. So I think really what I'm trying to say here is that it's all about learning to look at your specific situation and accept yourself exactly as you are, which I know, trust me, I really do know that can be so much easier said than done and it can take years and years. But let me tell you, even if you're sat here watching this right now and perhaps you feel really rotten today, you're having a rubbish symptom day, things feel out of your control, you're thinking of a million other things you should be doing, maybe you've not managed to have a shower for a few days or you've had to cancel on loved ones and you're feeling like a failure, maybe you feel like you're moving backwards rather than forwards. But let me tell you right now, even if every single one of those things is true, you are enough. You are more than enough and you are doing much, much better than you think you are. You are so incredibly valid and your wants and your desires in life matter just as much as any non-disabled person's. Other people's perceptions don't get to dictate who you are and how you live your life. I've written that down in bold here. <laughs> I think I need to stick that on my desk some, sometimes as well because I know it's one thing to say it and another thing to actually incorporate that into your life. But as we all know all too well, when you have an energy limiting condition, your time and energy is so incredibly precious, even more precious than anybody else's. And if you take anything at all away from this session today before we move on to questions, I hope you know that you can spend and cherish the energy you have, however you blooming like. And I don't just I just don't feel like we hear these things enough sometimes and I need to get better at actually saying them. But for me, I think all of these things and having that realization was probably the starting point that set me on the path to finding real fulfillment alongside fatigue and things that actually matter to me. And if that's something you're striving for too, and that's the reason that you joined the session today, I wish you only the very best on your journey too, because you deserve it. And I think I'm going to leave that here for now. That's me rambling on. Um, so I will say right now, thank you very much for listening and for your time today. I am going to go to the chat box. So if you have any questions at all, whether that's stuff we've talked about today or anything else that pops up, um, feel free. I will say again for, oh my gosh, we've still got people joining. This is wild. Um, Yes, I will say for the people who've just joined, um, this session has been recorded. So anything you've missed, we can go back and watch later. Um, and I, will, I won't I will say any names if you leave something in the chat box, but do be aware of that if you're choosing to share your lived experiences. I'm also gonna have a glug of water, so bear with me while I have a look through. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you very much for the kind words. That's lovely. Um, let's have a look. Okay, questions. 
any good resources for chronically ill folks with young children? That's a really great question. It's not um, an area of expertise for me, but I think there's some good children's books coming out at the minute. One to have a look at is called I Am Not a Label by Kerry Burnell from CBeebies. Um, that can be great, although I will say actually that's probably better for disability more broadly rather than the unique challenges of chronic illness. Um, there's if you've got children who are sort of middle grade age and they're readers, there's some really great middle grade books at the minute. Um, the Secret of Haven Point by Lizette Orton that has wonderful disability representation in it. Um, I'll see if I can find some more and I'll link them wherever this goes live. Um, is there any fatigue management program you know of? Um, that's a tricky one because I they can be so subjective and unique for individuals and we all need different things. Um, and some programs are better than others. I will say that the most benefit I've found from anything was occupational therapy. Um, so I, where I live in York, there was Yorkshire Fatigue Clinic, which is sadly now winding down. But the most powerful thing for me as an individual was simply sitting down with an OT who looked, who took the time to look at my own unique situation and consider, we considered together how we might adapt things and make them work for me within the context of my own situation. And I really strongly feel that is something that should be more broadly available for people with fatigue. Um, so it might be worth looking into whether there's anything like that in your um, local authority. Social prescribing is another good one. Um, but yes, I wish there was something that was more broadly available at the minute. Um, how do you balance working with your illness? With great difficulty, to be completely honest. Um, I write and speak a lot about this. It could be a completely different thing in its own right, but I will say this is shameless self-promotion, but on my blog and on my YouTube channel, I have lots of stuff about working with a chronic illness. Um, I think generally it can be really helpful to look at the aids and equipment that might be available to you, consider what reasonable adjustments you are entitled to and know that you are entitled to ask for them, even if your disability is less visible. Um, if anybody here is looking for inclusive work at the minute, I work for a really great small charity called Astrid. We match talented people with long-term illnesses with meaningful work. I will say that we have a big old waiting list and our services are very much in demand at the minute, but um, you can find Astrid at astrid.org. It's Astrid with two eyes, and there's some information and resources on there too. Um, any advice on overcoming fear or judgment and dirty looks when out of my wheelchair and walk a bit in public? Oh my goodness. Yes, first of all, you're not alone. Um, again, I have a video on my YouTube channel called Using Mobility Aids with ME, where I dive a bit more into that. Um, I think until we can change societal attitudes and perceptions of disability, I think sometimes all you can do is learn to find the humour in it, which I know is so much easier said than done, but I'm sure you'll collect some fantastic stories over the years like my favorite one so far is when I was in London I was using transit wheelchair I stood up to go into a restaurant and a businessman who was power walking in the, di in the other direction he was so startled that I'd got up out of the wheelchair that he tripped and fell over the pavement in front of him so you do have to you do have to find the funny side of it it is there I promise you but also your worries and your feelings are so valid and I'm so sorry you're experiencing that in day-to-day -day life because it it's rotten isn't it uh, how do you explain ME in a nutshell to others who have no understanding because it's exhausting to explain? That is so true. Um, it depends on the person and the situation. If it was me, I'd say I have a chronic illness called ME. It's a neurological condition that affects multiple different systems in the body. And for me, it means I deal with fatigue, pain, cognitive symptoms, sensory overload, and lots of other things as well. That's like my elevator <laughs> answer. Um, there's actually, if I remember rightly, there's a really great organization called the Lunar Project, and they have some online resources, especially for young people. And it's a project called From Me and My Friends to You and Yours. And they produce lots of different leaflets for lots of different chronic illnesses. And they're designed for people to be able to give them to their friends to try and explain succinctly what their illness means. Um, what it means for the friendship and what their friend can do to support them, which I think is such a great idea. So the Lunar Project, worth having a look at them. 
Um, I would really like to make some friends in the chronic illness community. Any advice on where or how best to do this? Yes, um, I think it will depend on the online medium you're comfortable with. I would personally really recommend social media platforms like Instagram. So it can be helpful to look at specific hashtags. So it might be your particular condition, e.g. hashtag MECFS. There are also more sort of community ones like hashtag Spoonie, um, hashtag Nice Void, N-E-I-S Void, and Nice Void stands for no end in sight. Um, so have a look on those hashtags, have a scroll through and see if there are any people who jump out to you. There are also some great disabled influencers um, and by following them, you often find access to a load of other great people as well. And failing that, it might be that specific charities who work in association with your particular condition, many of them have um, befriending, mentoring, buddying schemes like that. So it's worth using a bit of energy shopping around and seeing what's out there. But yeah, it's definitely worth it in the long run. Like chronically ill friends are the best friends. Oh, thank you very much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to share this. I'm not going to say the name in case they don't give consent, but this person says, I heard that acceptance is like a spiral staircase. You feel like you've circled back to the same place, but in reality, you're always a bit higher up. You've learned and grown. That's brilliant. That's thank you for sharing that. That's really powerful. That's so true as well. Uh, would it be possible to have the links to the resources or blog post you mentioned earlier, please? Let me do that right now. I'm going to put it in the chat box. Do, 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 do. Everyone in meeting. Okay, a few things in there. When this recording goes live, I will link any other resources I've mentioned in the description box. Um, oh no, I've lost my place. Oh no. <laughs> um, oh, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, would you be willing to speak to our occupational therapy students at York St. John? I would absolutely love that. Thank you so much. And funnily enough, my best friend has just graduated from York St. John as an OT last week. So I was actually at the graduation ceremony last week. I would love that. You can find all my contact details on my website. Um, resources or groups for writers with chronic illness. It's so hard to find advice that relates to my situation. I don't know if it exists specifically for chronic illness. I wish it did because you have my empathy. The challenges are very real. There's some good resources for disabled writers. Um, let me try and think. Um, there's some good resources happening, good resources. There's some good work happening in the publishing industry. Um, there's somebody called Claire Wade and she runs some sort of social group for disabled authors. Um, there's a lot of disabled journalists on Twitter. That's a great place. Um, tell you what, leave that one with me. I'll I'll have a look into that one as well. There must be. Um, but again, social media, following people who are writing with a chronic illness is incredibly validating. Um, this person says the long COVID self-help guidebook by the Oxfordshire post-COVID clinic is a good resource for fatigue management. So that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Chronic illness community can be daunting, like where to start, where to look, what to join. Yeah, totally feel that. Sometimes I remember when I joined, even though it was back in the day, it can feel as though everybody else knows what they're doing. Everybody is really comfortable sharing all of these things and they know how to interact with others. I think my advice to anybody in that situation now would be just to remember that there's no single right way to do social media. Um, social media is all about what you make it for you so you can engage as much or as little as you want um, don't be afraid to reach out and to say hello to people although in the same breath please don't be offended if they don't respond because one of the things I resent the most about being a chronically ill person on social media is that I can't respond and engage with people as much as I would really love to so please don't feel fit feel ugh. please don't feel hurt if that happens to you because the worst you can, the worst that can happen is they say no. Um, so just don't be afraid to put yourself out there because by doing that, you will find the people. You'll find your people. Um, conscious of time, I'm going to get through as many of these as possible. Um, somebody says, my simple explanation of ME is like, is I'm like a laptop with a broken battery, doesn't keep charge and takes forever to charge back up. 
That is so true and so relatable. It's really awesome when you find good analogies for chronic illness because you see it and you're like, yes, I can relate to that entirely. Oh, there's a link for the Lunar Project who I mentioned in the chat box. Uh, the Lunar Project are the ones who produce the resources for friends of people with chronic illness. Um, this person says, I found LinkedIn the best place to find similar people. That's really interesting. I still, I, my work is mostly in social media, but I will admit I do sometimes find LinkedIn a little bit daunting still. So that's really good to know. Um, Okay, we're coming to the um, end of questions now. So if you have any more, feel free to pop them in. Um, there is one question that kind of relates to medical advice and I'm gonna leave that out because um, that's a lot more difficult to safeguard in on platforms like this. Um, thank you very much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Um, what is your advice regarding applying for jobs uh, whereby on the application form under disabilities, would you declare it? Oh, you'll wish you hadn't asked me that because I've done a lot of work in this area. I wrote a whole research report about this. Um, it's on Astrid's website if you're interested. It's called um, Employment and Long-Term Illness, the Invisible Talent Pool. If we've got time, I might try and grab a link to it actually. But essentially it was about all of the different challenges that people with chronic illnesses face in finding and staying in work. And we found through our participants that knowing when to disclose your disability is one of the most challenging things. And we didn't find one simple answer. There doesn't seem to be one right answer for when to disclose your disability during the application process. A lot of people dealt with it on a case-by-case -case basis. They were led by their gut feeling and what they felt was most suitable for them. Um, it seemed to be influenced by how much knowledge they perceived that the employer had. Um, but my personal advice would be that if your chronic illness affects you significantly and it will affect your experience of applying for the role, don't be afraid to disclose it as early on as possible because sometimes that disclosure is the key to accessing workplace adjustments. And you are entitled to those same adjustments during the application process as well as in the role itself. Um, how do you explain to people that what you can do alone is very difficult different to what you can do around other people. I feel people perceive me as being able to do more than I really can because they don't see all of the pacing or symptoms. Yes, that is incredibly true and you're definitely not alone in that. Um, I think, I think one of the things that is most profound and sometimes it can be helpful to share this is that less visible disabilities it's not just your symptoms that are less visible but also all of the condition management and all of the stuff that goes into living and existing alongside your condition often that's less visible as well so even though other people can't necessarily see all that it takes you to put into doing this one particular thing sometimes just verbalizing that and helping people to see that Doing one thing is never just doing one thing when you have a chronic illness. There is so much other stuff that goes into it as well. And I think sometimes, as stereotypical as it is, the only way to deal with that is to just try and communicate that with other people. Um, any tips on applying for not being reviewed for disability benefits with a chronic illness that's dynamic so symptoms change all the time? What do I say when they ask what I can or can't do as it changes so much? That's, yeah, that's incredibly difficult. It's not um, an area I'm experienced with myself, although I have had some challenges with things like um, blue badges, because like you said, dynamic disability, um, and it's more difficult for people to see what your challenges are day to day. And like you said, it can change per day too. I'm trying to think if I know of any resources that, or any people who might be better placed to advise with that one than me. I think, the ME Association is probably, the ME Association do some great online informational leaflets and Action for ME, I'm pretty sure, have a welfare officer who you can contact with questions. So I think they're probably the one to ask. Again, I'm aware that it takes energy to ask and to access that help, but I think it's probably worth it in the long run for that one. I'd rather pass you on to them than give you incorrect advice. Oh, thank you to this person who has just said what I was trying to remember earlier. So the person who asked about writing with a chronic illness, the bookseller, the magazine had a recent issue that was curated by authors with disabilities and chronic illnesses. And there's a link to that in the chat for anyone who's here live. Yes, I felt like that was in the back of my mind and I just couldn't remember what it was. 
Um, there's also a great person, and I can't remember her name. She's a researcher with a chronic illness based at the University of Derby, and she's done some great work about disability and chronic illness inclusion in the publishing industry. Um, I, I'll try... If you're watching this and you're interested in any of these things, when this recording goes live on my YouTube channel, I will try and link as many things as I can find in the description box. Um, oh, that's really lovely. Somebody has put their Instagram details in the chat. So if anybody else wants to do that to connect with other people who are here today and maybe find that sense of community, please feel free to do that. Um, you can find me at Life of Pippa on most platforms. But yeah, if you do want to leave your social media handles please feel free um, that's absolutely fine I think I've come to the end of the questions but I have still got a couple of minutes so if there is anything you want to put in last off please feel free to do that um, other than that I just want to say thank you for being here like I said at the beginning your time and energy is so incredibly valuable when you have a chronic illness so it's been really wonderful to have you here today I really hope that at least something I've shared has been helpful because I know it's so so difficult to it's one thing to say you want to find joy and fulfillment and it's a whole other thing to actually do that when you're living with an energy limiting condition um and I am very conscious of that but I hope by sharing some of the things that have helped me there's been something that you can take away from it as well um brilliant thank you for sharing those links great resources in the chat box especially around the benefits questions um thank you so much for your kind words I really appreciate it I'm always worried that whether I'm going to be able to do it justice or whether it's actually going to be helpful. So it's really wonderful to hear that it has been. Um, like I said, it's the beginning of York Disability Week at the minute. They have a great program of events this year. You can find out all of the things that are going on um, on their website. And I think, I think I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thank you so much again for your kind words. It really is appreciated. Um, I hope that you're doing as well as possible today. I hope this week is a great one. Um, there's some, do you know what? I'm going to leave on a few more minutes because there's some um, Instagram handles being shared in the chat box if you are on social media and looking to connect with more people. But equally, feel free to leave if you're, if you're done, if you're ready for a rest. I know that's what I'm going to be doing next. I'm going to be having a lay down. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for being here. I'm just going to sit quietly for a minute so people can leave their details if they want to. But yeah, thank you so much for being here.